Hello friends and welcome to Middle Grade March. Middle Grade March is a fun yearly readathon hosted by these lovely people where we are encouraged to read middle grade. It's kind of right there in the title. And I have selected 10 middle grade books that I'm going to try to read in this video. But before we dive into those books, I first wanted to have a bit of a chat about whether adults should be reading children's books. Now obviously as a children's bookseller, I kind of have to read children's books, whether it's junior fiction picture books right up to young adult, in order to be able to hand sell and recommend those books to the right readers. So it makes a lot of sense for adults like me to be reading middle grade, but what about you? Should you be reading middle grade? Yesterday I came across a very short book slash essay by Catherine Rundell called Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You Are So Old and Wise. In this little essay of hers she essentially seeks to convince adult readers to read more children's books or at least be open to the idea of reading children's books and she talks about some of the incredible things that children's books have to offer. She spoke a little bit about the history of children's literature and how our modern conception of particularly middle grade is very much tied to old-timey fairy tales and how although modern children's literature is very different in a lot of ways from stereotypical fairy tales we can still see a lot of like the little tendrils the threads from that origin and she says quote children's fiction today is still shot through with exactly the same old furious thirst for justice that characterizes fairy tales and so it's to children's fiction that you turn if you want to feel awe and hunger and longing for justice. I really enjoyed this framing and this part of the discussion of Catherine Rundell reminding us of those connections to fairy tales and how inherent in fairy tales and so much of modern children's literature is a concept of fairness and justice. I think children's literature can be an incredible way for adults like me and you to reconnect with that core sense of justice, of fairness and wrong and right. I know a lot of big readers love to talk about how powerful reading is for fostering empathy. I think the same can definitely be said for children's literature, but in particular children's literature does something that I don't think a lot of adult literature does, and that is that it not only fosters empathy, but it fosters something else that is kind of essential for empathy, and that is of course imagination. And Catherine Rundell says imagination is not and never has been optional. It is at the heart of everything. The thing that allows us to experience the world from the perspective of others. The condition precedent of love itself. So justice and imagination are two things that Catherine Rundell really focuses on in terms of what children's literature has to offer adult readers. And while connected to those two things, I think the other thing that Catherine Rundell spends the most time in this essay speaking about is hope. She says, children's novels to me spoke and still speak of hope. They say, look, this is what bravery looks like. This is what generosity looks like. They tell me through the medium of wizards and lions and talking spiders that this world we live in is a world of people who tell jokes and who work and who endure. Children's books say the world is huge. They say hope counts for something. They say bravery will matter. Wit will matter. Empathy will matter. Love will matter. Another thing Catherine Rundell speaks about in this essay is the idea that so much of reading these days under capitalism in particular is focused on like self-optimization. And I think there are an awful lot of people in the world, and I think scarily this number is increasing, who genuinely believe that any kind of reading that doesn't involve self-optimization is pointless. And to this Catherine Rundell says, for reading not to become something that we do for anxious self-optimization, for it not to be akin to buying high-spec trainers and a gym membership each January, all texts must be open to all people. And obviously that includes children's fiction. And of course in a world where fiction more generally or in particular genre fiction is denigrated and disrespected, not taken seriously, kind of dismissed rather flippantly, it is all too easy to dismiss something like children's literature as unimportant and irrelevant to adults. But, and this might be one of my favourite quotes, Catherine Rundell says, Defy those who would tell you to be serious, to calculate the profit of your imagination, those who would limit joy in the name of propriety. Cut shame off at the knees. Ignore those who would call it mindless escapism. It's not escapism. It is findism. Children's books are not a hiding place. They are a seeking place. Plunge yourself soul forward into a children's book. See if you do not find in them an unexpected alchemy. Read a children's book to remember what it was to long for impossible and perhaps not impossible things. Go to children's fiction to see the world with double eyes, your own and those of your childhood self. Refuse unflinchingly to be embarrassed and in exchange you get the second star to the right 
and straight on till morning. So I clearly really enjoyed this little essay by Catherine Rundell and I think she makes some incredible points. There's something about children's literature that just really gets to the reality and the truth and the heart of things. I think children's literature can help adults like you and me remember that even though yes our world is messy and ridiculous and complex and hard, sometimes we also make things a lot bigger and messier and harder than they need to be and a lot more complex than they need to be. Sometimes truth and reality is much more simple than we might like to think and children's literature has a way of helping us remember that. So if you have not read a children's book in a while I would highly encourage you to. I have a whole bunch of recommendations videos which I'll leave in the description box below for you if you're looking for some recommendations. But with all of that out of the way it is now time for me to get to reading a bunch of middle grade. I have so much unread middle grade on my shelf. This is just a small selection. I have just over two weeks and I'm going to try and read as many of these books as possible. So without further ado let's get to reading. So my latest reads have actually been graphic novels. I borrowed these from work. I am a children's bookseller as I mentioned. Should we start with the good news or the bad news first? Let's get the bad news out of the way. The bad news and honestly I am shocked. I am DNFing Nimona. What? Now hear me out. I absolutely understand that this is beloved. Like people adore Nimona. I only got up to page like 36 which is a couple of pages into chapter 5 and at the end of the day I just was not getting hooked by this. And I think there's something about the fact that this was originally pub published as a webtoon. So each chapter I'm assuming was released like once every week or once every month or whatever the schedule was. Each chapter kind of stood on its own. And so far it just feels a little, I don't know, like directionless and I'm, I'm just not feeling sucked in in any way. Basically in this story we're introduced to Nimona who is kind of obsessed with this big dark supervillain Lord Blackheart. I do love that. I do love that as a name for a supervillain. Anyway Nimona is obsessed with this guy right and she convinces him very early on to let her be his new sidekick. And at first he's not interested because Nimona just seems like a bundle of chaos but it turns out she's a shapeshifter which obviously that sort of thing could come in handy. And so he agrees he lets Nimona become his new sidekick and we've just spent the first few chapters of watching them kind of start to figure out what their dynamic what their relationship is going to be like. And so far Nimona is just chaos that's the best way I can put it. Chaotic evil wrapped in bubblegum and fairy floss is how I would describe Nimona. She's cute she's funny she's bubbly but she also is just thrilled about about the idea of killing people. And all of this does sound quite fun but like I said there was just something about it that wasn't hooking me as far as the narrative was concerned. So I'd rather sit it down now rather than force myself through it and just end up resenting it you know? Because at least that leaves me open to potentially returning to it again someday. The next graphic novel though I'm happy to say I did finish and I did really enjoy. This is Things in the Basement. In this graphic novel we basically follow our main character Milo who's a young boy who is asked by his mother to go collect something uh, down in the basement and when he goes he basically ends up like finding all these secret passages that just like he realizes that the basement keeps going and going and going and there's tunnels and there's secret rooms and of course in those tunnels and secret rooms there's weird creatures and weird monsters and a ghost and so of course a little bit of a quest adventure kind of thing ensues. And the art in this is honestly beautiful. There's parts of like the the way that the lighting is done and in particular the way that the paneling is done that did remind me a little bit of Lightfall and I was also surprised by how non-wordy this book is. For a graphic novel there really is not a lot of speech at all or text or anything. There is so much of this like here's just one random page. There's literally two words. Two words. More slime. That is it on this entire page and we have like eight panels. Some pages are a little bit more wordy but not by much. This is one of those graphic novels that really does allow the artwork to shine and it's the artwork that is doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to the narrative and the storytelling which is something I really appreciate it. I feel like sometimes graphic novels can get almost like overly wordy because there's so much that's tried to be jammed pack into a graphic novel that you almost need to be explained to what the art isn't able to convey. This book is the opposite to that. The creator both trusts the reader to follow along but also gives so much in the artwork itself. And I think for that reason this feels really atmospheric and it feels you know a little bit spooky and scary in places where I don't think it necessarily would have if it had focused too much or relied more on words. And while it is a little bit creepy it's not 
overly scary and ultimately it has quite like a wholesome message and tone towards the end. A lot of stuff about friendship and loyalty and helping each other, all of that good stuff. So I really enjoyed it. I thought it was quite sweet. I thought it was quite fun and I thought it was really effective. And I think especially for, you know, young people who are a little bit intimidated by books or don't always necessarily feel very confident in their reading because this doesn't overly rely on text this could be a great gateway for them into graphic novels or just for people who really love and appreciate art i don't think you can go wrong with this one so we had a bit of a miss but we also had a hit now on to the next books i'm so happy to tell you that we have two books to talk about the first one is the lost library this is by rebecca stead and wendy mass and it's not a very long book but i found it quite charming our main character's name in this book is evan and he's a fifth grade student in kind of like a small town when one day where the local library burnt down a couple of decades before there appears a mysterious little library it's basically just a little cart with books available for people to take but nobody knows where this cart came from or where the books came from and just to make things a little bit stranger there is this big beautiful old ginger cat who is always kind of like patrolling and protecting this free little library. Evan of course finds this a little bit peculiar but when he realizes that all of the books were from that burnt down library and they were all returned on the same day like the little library card on the inside all of them have the same date on them he starts diving down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what happened to this old library and where these books have come from it's quite a small premise in a lot of ways it feels very small town and it definitely has that charm to it although this is fantasy there are magical elements the core of this feels much more like a mystery with evan having to dive into the past of his town and his family to find out what happened to the library that burnt down and in particular why nobody has ever wanted to rebuild it this book features lots of of pretty short chapters all told from different perspectives including some chapters told from the cat's perspective his name is mortimer in case you were wondering and he's adorable so this is one of those short fun entertaining reads that i found satisfying and charming and i just i had a really nice time with it and actually there was one quote in here that i wanted to read to because i thought it was just delightful this is somebody reflecting on children and young readers these young readers felt things about books which is why i call them great readers being a great reader has nothing to do with reading great sophisticated books or reading great long books or even with reading a great many books. Being a great reader means feeling something about books. Oh, I just loved it. I thought it was so sweet. Then changing up the pace a little bit, the next book that I read is A Rover's Story by Jasmine Wolga. This is a pretty new release, at least here in Australia, and it's a little bit sci-fi. Basically, this is an entire book told from the perspective of the Mars rover, whose name in this book is Rez, short for resilience. This is definitely one of those sci-fi books that doesn't feel too sci-fi. It more feels contemporary with a bit of a sci-fi twist, obviously being told from the perspective of a robot. But in this case, Rez is grappling with consciousness and what it means to be alive and also kind of figuring out what it means to be a robot and whether he's too human because he has feelings and all of this sort of stuff. Also, there's a little girl who writes letters to him. I don't know whether he actually ever receives the letters, but it's, you know, part of our narrative. And her whole journey was a very sweet addition to this. I liked a lot about this book. I felt really drawn in in the first, I'd say, quarter of the book. And so while I felt very drawn to Rez and his journey, there were a few things that held me back from falling in love with the story overall. I think the first would be that it just felt a little bit long for what it was. It's very nearly 300 pages and I just felt like some of that could have been trimmed down and I think in doing so it would have made more of an impact on me. The other thing and I don't want to harp on about this for too long but it just felt a little bit strange to me for a story about a robot and there were other robot characters involved as well. Gender played a, like a very significant role in this book. Obviously I refer to Rez as a he because that is how the book describes him and that is how he sees himself. But there are three other robot characters that are featured. Another one is also referred to as he him and honestly that might have been my favorite character of the entire book loved that character but then there were two other robot or robot adjacent characters who were given the pronouns she her and the way that both of those two female for lack of a better word robots are described and characterized is just very kind of like stereotypical and not pleasant things like both of them being characterized as bossy and know-it-alls and all of that sort of stuff while our male robots are fun and thoughtful and kind and brave. I don't know, it wasn't enough of the book to make me like angry at the book overall, but it was something that just, it felt entirely unnecessary, especially because 
they're robots. Why do they have genders at all? Why are we doing this at all? Anyway, all of that is to say that I had a good enough time with this. Like I said, I kind of wished it was shorter. There was a couple of things that I didn't love about it, but it was a fun read. But that is another two books down. Let's get back to reading. Can we all take a deep breath in? And then can we all just promise together that this this is a safe space? My reading has not been going great lately. I mean, we've already DNF'd one book out of the four that we've read. We're about to add two more to that list of DNFs. So let's talk about the first one, which was kind of expected, if I'm being honest. This is the new book by Jacqueline Moriarty, and it's a standalone, but it's still within the same world as um, the Bronte Metalstone books. So it is a Kingdoms and Empires book, but it's a standalone. So back when it very first came out, before I was a children's bookseller, I actually did pick up the first Bronte Metalstone book and tried to read it. And to be completely clear with you, I didn't like that book. Uh, it is a very unpopular opinion, especially within children's books, Australia, like that kind of sphere. People love these books. And I read well over half of this book. Sorry, it's bendy. I read up to report number five, page 308. Basically the setup for this one is Lillian lives alone with her grandmother who seems to be a very controlling kind of woman but one day she finds herself in another realm and this just kind of keeps happening to her. She'll be like cleaning the bathroom and she'll just pop over into another world into another time for a little while before popping right back. So it's a fun premise right like I like the idea of it but this just keeps happening. I'm 300 pages in and we just keep getting little glimpses of potential adventure. And at one point Lillian even says something about how all of these little journeys that she goes on they feel like the first chapter in a bigger story and I couldn't agree more. I don't think I finished Bronte Metalstone back in 2017 and yeah I probably should have DNF'd sooner but I was trying to push through. Okay now we have to talk about the one that I really don't want to talk about, the book that I really don't want to be DNFing for so many reasons and we'll talk about that but it is Thunderbird by Sonia Nimra. Ugh, oh, I hate this for me. I am up to page 50, so that's almost halfway. In this book, we're following Noor, who is a young girl whose parents have recently passed away in a plane crash. She's now living with some extended family who aren't as warm and welcoming as, you know, clearly a young girl like her going through a lot deserves. And to top it all off, fires just kind of start around Noor when she has big feelings. It's not intentional, she can't explain it, but like there's just fires happening all the time when she's around. On the back it's described as a time traveling fantasy adventure. I have not got to the time traveling element yet um, and I suppose as much as I like Noor, as much as I like the idea of the setup, it's just feeling very plodding. And I think the reason I'm especially upset about this is obviously like I was excited, I was really excited to find a middle grade by a Palestinian author. But on top of that, this is an author that I have read from and loved previously. I'm sure that it's about to pick up, but I've been feeling like that for the last 30 pages or so. I just like kind of keep waiting for the hook to actually hook me. I read a few Goodreads reviews, as you do, and a lot of them say that this ends on a cliffhanger. And so when I'm already struggling this much, when I'm already not enjoying the book, the idea of pushing through only to end on a cliffhanger, like it's not even gonna be satisfying in and of itself. Like that tiny piece of information made the idea of trying to push through the last 50 or 60 pages just seem like even more insurmountable than it already did. So an absolute Debbie Downer of a check-in, two DNFs. Does that mean we've DNF'd half the book so far? Oh my God. <laughs> so I think what I'm gonna do next is to pick a book that I'm almost convinced I'm gonna love. And hopefully that can turn this ship around. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> I have some good news. I have read three more books in the last couple of days and I liked all three of them. What a comeback. So the book that I picked out that I was pretty convinced I was going to love is War 2. This is a brand new release and it is billed as an indigenous Winnie the Pooh meets Blinky Bill. This book is just delightful. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Basically, we are introduced to War 2. He is a wombat, a hairy nose wombat to be precise. And after surviving a bushfire a couple of years back, he's become a recluse. He's kind of terrified of everyone and everything to the point where he literally goes out during the day to avoid coming into contact with any of the other marsupials. And Watu is in love with the sky. He's so obsessed and in love with the sky that he has grand plans of asking her 
to marry him. <laughs> He's convinced that the little clouds that she sends are like her basically sending kisses his way and the different colors of the sky are her putting on different dresses for him. It's kind of adorable. The book literally starts out saying, did you ever hear the story about Wartu, the wombat who fell in love with the sky? Well, I'm warning you now, if you're here for a love story, you'll surely be disappointed. It's not that this book is not a love story, but it's also a tale of sheer survival. Yes, a perilous plot of bravery, action, and adventure. Anyway, through a series of events, he basically becomes unlikely, even slightly hesitant friends with a koala named Kula. And soon enough, Wartu explains to this koala that he needs to go on an adventure to find the biggest gum tree to climb to the top so that he can ask the sky to marry him. And although this koala thinks he's kind of bonkers, cause like you can't marry the sky, she agrees to come on this little adventure with him. And so these two unlikely friends set off. This was pretty short, but it was just as delightful and as charming as it sounds. I love this cover. We've even got some cute illustrations throughout as well. I just had a great time with this book. Then I got stuck into a graphic novel that I picked up recently secondhand. I read The OK Witch and I had a pretty good time with this one too. The art in here is lovely. The colors, the panels, the illustrations and like the speech and everything was easy to follow, engaging, all of that good stuff. In this one, we're introduced to a 13 year old girl named Moth who is just a little bit odd and finds it hard to fit in in the small town that she and her mum live. When one day she realizes that she's actually a witch and her mum has known all about this, turns out her mum's a witch too, but she's been keeping it a secret because she's actually like living sort of in exile after like running away from her mother. And it turns out this family has links to like the 1600s and the witch trials and all of this sort of stuff. And so obviously there are reasons that her mother has wanted to keep her safe and like keep her magic a secret. There were one or two things in this book that were just kind of mentioned in passing that did honestly rub me the wrong way. One example would be when they're talking about like the 1600s hundreds and witches in America. They're talking about like how women and witches had to flee Europe and come to America, which kind of felt like a weird white feminist way to look at colonization, you know? There's just a couple of things like that that were very small, literally one or two panels, like hardly even relevant to the story that were just thrown in that just didn't quite work for me. Having said that, overall, I did really enjoy the story and I really, really liked our character Moth. And ultimately in this story, we get to know quite well three generations of women who have all had to make difficult decisions. And now we're watching the current generation, our 13 year old moth, make her own choices in amidst all of that. So it wasn't perfect, but there certainly was a lot to like here. Then lastly, of these three books that I have had a good time with in the last two days, I finally got to a book that I've been meaning to read maybe for two years now. <laughs> Let me set the scene. My manager at work is a massive Terry Pratchett fan, like the biggest fan I've ever met. So since I started working for her, she's been trying to convince me to read Terry Pratchett, of course. And ages ago, I bought We Free Men and I just, I think I've been putting it off because I feel like Discworld is something I might really like, but also the fact that my manager loves it so much. Like there's, there's quite a bit of pressure on this book. Anyway, if I'm not gonna read it in middle grade March, when am I? So I finally picked it up and I had a really good time with this one. Tiffany's a young girl who's living in like this rural town. It sort of feels pre-industrial kind of setting. And even though witches are detested in this society, Tiffany has always just kind of had dreams of being a witch herself. And one day when her little baby brother goes missing and she kind of treks out starting to find out where he might be, she comes across a bunch of little blue men <laughs> who seem kind of in awe, but also terrified of her and like basically answer to her every whim, do anything she says. Because it turns out, of course, Tiffany is a witch. And so basically they agree to help her go and find her little brother and rescue him. And it's as fantastical and charming and funny and absurd as it sounds. And I just had a really good time. I don't know that I would go so far as to say that this is a new favorite book, but I already wanna read the next book in the Tiffany Aching series. In fact, I've already bought the second book and I'm not entirely sure I'm ready to commit to the entirety of Discworld, but I do I do wanna continue at least with Tiffany's story. I had such a good time. I found some moments really moving. I really like the way that Terry Pratchett sort of plays with uh, common sense and sort of twists it on its head, but in a way that feels so emotionally intuitive and more real than whatever it is that we think. Also the little wee free men, the little blue guys, they talk about how they're all dead and this is actually their heaven. Even how one of the characters who is a witch who we meet early on, her name is Miss Tick. I'll spell it here, but like obviously that's essentially a pun for mystic. <laughs> 
just stuff like that. It's so playful. Like everything about this book is playful, but in a really like earnest and sincere kind of way. And I love that. I love that balance. So yeah, I think so far this will probably be the biggest hit of the video. I mean, War 2 was adorable, but I mean, the fact that I, I've finally kind of broken the seal on Discworld and I'm starting and I want more, that's pretty exciting. I am feeling optimistic at this point that we can maintain some of this good momentum. So I'm gonna get back to reading. So I have read two more books, which means it's time to check in. And these are two very different books. One is a book that I have seen people categorize as both YA and middle grade. And that is of course, Tiger Daughter by Rebecca Lim. This has been a highly celebrated book here in Australia in the last couple of years. And it's one of those books that is grappling difficult subjects in a very tender way. So ultimately it's a very emotional and hard hitting kind of a story. This book is centered on our main character Wen, who is the only child of Chinese immigrants to Australia. And it says right here on the back that their move to the lucky country has proven to be not so lucky after all. Basically Wen's parents are not doing great financially. Wen's father was trained as like a doctor or a pharmacist or something, but his like accreditations weren't immediately accepted here in Australia. He had to kind of go through a process and an assessment, which he failed, probably more likely due to language barriers than anything else. But he really took this as a hard hit to his ego. And so he's working in kind of manual labor and he's ultimately a very angry and controlling man. In terms of the level of kind of content warning I need to give, I don't remember there being any explicit physical violence, but there's like a con constant thread of tension. And I think he's verbally abusive and he's just very controlling of both Wen's mother and Wen. And he has outbursts of aggression and like emotional manipulation when his standards aren't met. So like I said, pretty heavy, but basically Wen has this one friend at school named Henry, who is also the child of immigrants. And Henry is kind of a genius. So he has hatched this plan to sit some fancy exam where he's gonna get a scholarship to a fancy school so he can have a big bright future ahead of him. And he's convinced Wen, who is a good student, but not necessarily on the same level as him, to join him, to sit that same exam and to have the same bright future together. It's honestly beautiful. And we kind of see the importance of this relationship when something really awful happens in Henry's life. Now, some people will consider this a spoiler, but you know me, there's some things that I just feel like should be told, if not in detail, like specified at the very least as content warnings. So basically Henry's mother dies by suicide. So an awful lot is packed into here. It's very emotional, it's very heavy. And it's really powerful. And I think one of my favorite things about this book was how, even though I've spoken at length about, you know, the issues within Wen's family, in particular her father, these people aren't excused, but they're also not like unnecessarily demonized. Essentially all of the characters in this book feel like actual people. We understand where so much of Wen's father's like anger and hurt and like ego issues, where they're all coming from. And we can see the thread that binds that to his current actions, not in any way to excuse them, but to understand them, to add complexity to the experience of immigration and how hostile coming to a new country like Australia can be and how difficult that is, not just financially, but also like the weight that that then puts on emotional relationships and stuff like that too. All of that to say is that there was definitely an awful lot to like about this book. I found it very moving and yeah, I think it's kind of incredible. It was beautifully written too. Then I read a book I was so excited to find secondhand recently. It was Withering by Sea. This is a very pretty hardcover book and it's kind of like a Victorian fantasy mystery series. I mean, this is the first book in that series. At the beginning of the book, we're introduced to a young girl named Stella who is living under like the care of three aunts who are all kind of horrible. And the blurb doesn't really say much. And I feel like to try and explain the setup of this story, I feel like it could sound quite convoluted. I suppose the crux of it is that Stella comes into possession of a strange object that a big, scary, evil man really wants to get his hands on. And so murder and mayhem and magic ensue. I really enjoyed the writing of this. This is one of those middle grades that I think would be great for younger, really strong readers. It's the kind, it uses the kind of language that is not speaking down to the reader whatsoever. And in some ways it's quite flowery, especially for a middle grade book. I really liked quite a lot of the side characters. There was one character in particular who was this old like Italian man with a bunch of cats who sing. He was cute, I liked him. In a lot of ways, this book reminded me a little bit of 
a series of unfortunate events, but also of Roald Dahl. You know how in Roald Dahl, like a lot of the adults are just like horrible. <laughs> and like, there's just a lot of like bad things that happen. This definitely had that vibe. And I have learned over time that that, that is not so much my vibe personally. And it just never really hooked me. And I think at the end of the day, that had a lot to do with the plot, the pacing, and also Stella as a main character. It's one of those books where our main character is kind of just like this meek, sweet Mary Sue, but she doesn't really have a lot of agency in the story itself. Everything's just kind of like happening to her. It had the setting, it had the vibe, but because there wasn't that warmth of a connection at the center of it, it just felt, yeah kind of miserable. But like I said, I'm not a fan of a lot of Roald Dahl and I didn't like a series of unfortunate events. So maybe if that is more your thing, this book could be more your thing, but it, I don't think it's mine. And I'm sad about it because this is such a pretty book. There's some really cool illustrations and the writing was beautiful too. And I did like that Italian guy with the singing cats. So those are two more books that we can add to our red pile. Now I think I'm gonna try and squeeze one more in and it is the book that I have been most anticipating this entire month. I feel like it's gonna be a banger. I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm gonna get straight to reading and I'll talk to you soon. So I have indeed managed to squeeze in one more book and it was of course Alibrijes by Donna Barbara Higuera. This is the author's second book. Her first one was of course The Last Contista which was one of my favorites. I loved it. So I have been highly anticipating this one. This is another very thoughtful high concept science fiction exploring some really heavy topics around colonialism, exploitation, and it even touches on some topics around genocide. So some similar themes to the first book, but done in a very different way. Here we are kind of like three or 400 years in the future on earth. We don't know much about the history, what has kind of taken place between our current day and this current day. All we know is that essentially there aren't a lot of humans left. Those that are left are really struggling to survive. And essentially there was some kind of apocalypse situation. In this book, we're following a 13 year old boy named Leandro and his younger sister, Gabby. They are living and working in the city called Pocatel, but they are very much the lowest of the low classes. They and people like them essentially serve as forced labor, but Leandro has big plans for him and his sister to escape. And I'm just gonna read this next part here on the blurb for you because it does tell you something that happens kind of like a third of the way into the story. So, I mean, clearly they don't think it's a spoiler, but I wanna be careful about how I talk about it to avoid spoilers. So to be safe, I'm just gonna read what they've put here. But then Leandro's luck runs out and he is given an impossible choice to accept certain death facing the spirits and worms in the wilderness or to leave his body behind and allow his mind to be encased in an ancient drone. In this form, he can fly in search of freedom, hope and truth. Can he hold onto his memories and find a way safely back to his sister? and himself. I'm honestly finding it a little bit difficult to talk about this book for several reasons. One is that there's an awful lot going on. It's quite complex and in some ways I think a little convoluted. This is by no means a short middle grade book. It's almost 400 pages and where I felt like a book like The Last Quintista really earned every single one of those pages, I felt, I felt a little bit like this one dragged. The pacing did not work quite as well. There was a hell of a lot going on. I don't wanna make it sound like this is slow in any way, but there was just something about the narrative and the characters that didn't really draw me in in the same way that The Last Quintista did. I think the other thing that is just kind of niggling at me is that this is positioned as middle grade and I don't know that I agree with that categorization. The Last Quintista was definitely an ambitious middle grade book. It was for older middle grade readers, stronger, more ambitious middle grade readers. This book kind of felt like it stretched that even further. And because this is essentially a very heavy dystopian, it just felt much more like I was reading a middle grade version of what should have been a young adult book. I honestly can't think of very many 10 year olds that I would comfortably recommend this to. There might be a handful of 11 year olds, but that would not be a broad recommendation. I would be looking more to 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds to recommend this to. And at least in my shop, generally speaking, we refer to middle fiction as something that is targeted towards eight to 12 year olds. So not the big win I was hoping to end this video on, but like I said, I am still glad that I read it. We did manage to get through the 10 books that I was hoping to. And then obviously we also read those two graphic novels that I borrowed from work. So we have read 
12 books together, although I suppose I DNF'd three of those. And obviously I am somebody who reads quite a bit of middle grade, but I don't think I've ever kind of just sat down and read this much middle grade back to back. And especially with the kind of conversation that we started in the introduction about whether adults should be reading middle grade, what adults can get from middle grade, reading all of this middle grade in the last few weeks, I've just been kind of pondering that question a little bit more. And I suppose if I could add anything to Catherine Rundell's essay, I guess there would be two main things that I keep coming back to as to why I love middle grade outside of being a children's bookseller. The first one is probably going to sound a little bit corny, but I'm convinced that I think reading middle grade, especially books where you can identify your younger self with perhaps the main character or any character in the book, there is honestly something so healing about that because often in middle grade books there is so much compassion and empathy when exploring harder experiences that children go through and so I think reading a compassionate kind honest portrayal of maybe something that your younger self identifies with honestly just has such a way of encouraging compassion and empathy for our younger selves and honestly I have found that kind of thing healing. The second thing I love about reading middle grade comes back to I suppose a more social political reason and that essentially comes down to the fact that I think in our world I mean more historically but I think it continues children generally as a category are essentially dehumanized and even though we don't really say things like children should be seen and not heard anymore I think there's still something of like some essence of that sentiment that still exists in much of society. And that's one of the reasons I just love middle grade as a category. I feel like middle grade is one of the few spaces in our modern world that genuinely, truly takes children seriously. And although Catherine Rundell specified fairy tales and the origins of fairy tales influencing middle grade as to why a lot of children's books explore concepts around justice and fairness. I think there's also something to the fact that so many of these authors are recognizing something in the childhood experience that is intrinsically unjust and unfair in our modern world. That sense of children not having control over their lives, that sense of children not being listened to, not having a voice. Sometimes that is literally within their own families, but I think almost always that is on a larger scale too. I think a lot of us as adults can identify with childhood struggles of invalidation and dismissal and how hurtful and harmful those things were. Often those are the things that we find ourselves trying to heal from in our adulthood. And I think there's just something so powerful and magical and rehumanizing about engaging with children's literature. And I think this is one of the greatest gifts that middle fiction and children's literature more generally has given me as an adult. A much broader and deeper sense of appreciation, compassion and empathy with children. But anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox. I feel like we have had a very successful couple of weeks reading. I would say my favourite books of the vlog in order. Well, We Free Men, I think this one's my favourite, although War 2 is a close second. And then Tiger Daughter follows again pretty closely behind. And then The Lost Library was just a really delightful read. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you to the creators and hosts of Middle Grade March. And of course, a big thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. And especially big thank you to Olivia, Lynette Brown and Marie. And thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear in the comments below if you've read any middle grade this month or if you're planning to pick some up in the near future. I will see you again very soon. I think my next video is probably going to be my March reading wrap up. So until then, happy reading. Bye!